87 years ago, on the day that we're recording this, the working class of East London, made up of Jewish and Gentile men and women, trade unionists, socialists, and anarchists, stood down and fought not only the police, but those whom the police were protecting. That is, Oswald Mosley's British Union of Fascists. The black shirts. Those same fascisti whom elements in the British press, such as the Daily Mail, once shouted hurrah for. This was the Battle of Cable Street, where it was decided that the enemy, in the advocacy of violent class and racial oppression, would not pass. They would not spread. They would not speak. Even before the horrors of the Second World War and the Shoah, it was recognized that this could not pass. This could not be allowed. Not even through the universities and their various debating societies and presses. The fascist stain would be tackled by any means necessary. The tactics of anti-fascism are wide and diffuse, but the one we are here to discuss today is one of the most contentious and, in my view, one of the most necessary in the contemporary media ecosystem. A media ecosystem where transphobia, racism, homophobia and reaction are all fermenting into a new foghorn of contemporary fascism. The tactic is this. No platform. No platform for those who would advocate for the destruction of our comrades and their right to health and happiness. Today, I have the privilege of being joined by the historian, archivist, and theorist Evan Smith to discuss his history of no platform as a tactic amongst the British left and its relevance to understanding the contemporary right today. His book, No Platform, A History of Anti-Fascism, Universities, and the Limits of Free Speech, is out on Routledge, and he is currently working on an ongoing project chronicling one of the antagonists, I guess we could say, of this discourse, the Revolutionary Communist Party, and its afterlives as spiked online and its network, which has found such strange bedfellows from Boris Johnson to Viktor Orban. Evan, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Thank you for having me. So first and foremost, I just want to, if you could, if you just summarize what no platform is, it's not just a tactic, but it also named a distinct policy, which is kind of bureaucratically sort of inserted into universities. How does no platform work in university bodies and to what extent is it still operative today in many universities, particularly in the United Kingdom? Yeah, so no platform is essentially the, the concept that fascists and racists and in some cases, other forms of bigotry and hate speech and stuff like that should not have a platform. It emerges out of anti-fascism in the 1970s, particularly crossover between the student left and the kind of the Trotskyist left, that the universities should not be a place where they should have a platform, so no access to student union buildings, not being invited to debate or speak on university premises. Student union funds shouldn't be given to groups that, that like the National Front Youth Group or whatever, and and not being able to have that kind of platform. It starts it starts out in the universities because it's a place where the students can kind of organize and have some kind of say in how that space is is used and run and like my kind of history like looks at the university campus as a contested space it's public but also not public like it's not like the streets where we see much more confrontation between fascists and anti-fascists and stuff like that it is a place you know where people could congregate but there is a limit on who can be inside this space. So when it first developed, no platform is in the early 1970s. The National Front in Britain is like in the ascendancy and they're trying to make their presence known on university campuses, sometimes through intimidating student, the student left, sometimes being invited to debate or speak at different universities and no platform was this kind of this idea from the Trotskyist group so the international Marxist group the international socialists and some members of the communist party saying that actually no we need to take stand against this that groups like the national front can't be on campus and so in 1974 they convinced the national union of students to have a policy of no platform or 
that it's not it's not worded as no platform, but it's like a platform won't be given and they'll be denied by any means necessary. This includes disruption of meetings, et cetera, et cetera. So no platform at its at basic is is that you don't give a physical platform to fascist groups to preach their message, to organize, to sell newspapers, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where it comes out of. And then it's it morphs into different areas. So we talk about deplatforming, which is that should the far right, should fascists have access to social media, like the, the like calling for like fascist groups to not be on Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. And also kind of like in the media, like you don't invite fascists to be on BBC panel programs like Question Time and Nick Griffin in, in the 2010, uh, 9-10. So it goes off in different areas, but originally it starts as an idea from the university saying that, no, there should not be a space available for fascists and racists to expand their message. When it comes to the history of British anti-fascism, of course, I started with a sort of a riff on the Battle of Cable Street. Do you, to what extent has that tactic basically developed out of an early history of anti-fascism? And is it, some, is it in a way sort of trailing the successes and what not successes against Mosley, basically, against the Black Shirts from the 1930s onwards? And I guess, how does that how does no platform sit amongst sort of a wider practice of anti-fascism? Because there's a tendency to reduce anti-fascism in, in sort of its very discursive media landscape to simply taking the platform away. But it, it's part of an extensive toolkit, as I understand it. Yeah. So the people who have developed no platform in the 1970s and even through to today, like take inspiration from the anti-fascism of the 30s and 40s. Cable Street is very important. It's when the like over a hundred thousand people organize on the streets of London and say they the, the the fascism needs to be confronted, we need to do it in large numbers. We don't won't give them the physical space, we won't give them the platform to demonstrate, etc. And it comes off some earlier interventions. So in nineteen thirty four there's two big ones. In June nineteen thirty four there's a disruption of a uh, British Union of Fascist Rally at Olympia, where Communist Party members and other anti fascists like get access to the rally and then heckle and and they're eventually they're turfed out. And then there's like in later that year, the BUF tried to have a rally at Hyde Park and like that then there's like masses descend on Hyde Park and like and refuse to let the BUF hold their rally. So there's a kind of this idea of like, yeah, you don't let fascists organise, you don't let them speak. There's a campaign in the 30s to not let fascists hold meetings at town halls and stuff like that. So like uh, particularly spaces that are owned and operated by local councils so that fa- anti-fascists would compel like local labour councils particularly not to let the BUF hold their meetings in buildings. After the war, we see this again, like the like the fascists are smaller. Obviously, the Second World War has diminished their size, but they start like speaking on street corners and stuff like that. So there's a place like in East Lo- in East London, in uh, Hackney and Dalston, where uh, are places along Ridley Road, where they're trying to have these kind of like soapbox speeches. And anti-fascists like the 43 group, which is kind of like a mixture of Jewish activists and communists, their tactic was called jumping the pitch, where they would like physically occupy the space where the fascists would organise so that so the so they couldn't uh, like have that space to get on their soapbox and stuff like that. And so it was about a physical again, it's about a physical denial of space. But yeah, like Anti-fascism is not just confrontation, it's not just street fights, it's not just no platforming. It's a whole bunch of different tactics. It's about fighting elections, it's about put footing anti-fascist arguments to people. It's not just about confrontation, but you know, but there is a need in a lot of it to kind of like 
realize that the fascism doesn't sit in the kind of normal space of politics, the normal political landscape, and it shouldn't be treated as just another political view. There's something inherently more dangerous. Like Nigel Copsey has written like a lot about anti-fascism and the history of anti-fascism, and he talks about like legal anti-fascism, he talks about militant anti-fascism, he talks about liberal anti-fascism. So yeah, like no platform is a militant tactic but it is not just the only tactic used by anti-fascists. I, I very much appreciate the focus you put on the literal spatial aspects of no platforming because it it basically just goes through material concerns thereof, denying them that space. But also how sort of weird it can get now when it comes to the notion of no platforming in cyberspace when it is increasingly cons- constructed of platforms. And so I guess I guess in a sense, to use a, a technical term, it's been the term has been totally deterritorialized into mm-hmm. cyberspace. And I mean how I mean what do you, how do you think sites sort of the media ecosystem of cyberspace, or at least you know, the internet, has changed the tactics or even the language in which we speak about deplatforming? Yeah, so that's the thing is that like no platform and what I've really looked at is is about no platform at universities because that's still a lot of the time it's like inviting someone to speak or like a student group organizing. But yeah, like the the far right have have always had her hand in using the internet to spread their message and organize and stuff like that. And it's it's a it's a difficult thing like it's that a lot of the time that, that we are like, I kind of differentiate no platform is something more physical and something more kind of like about the, you know, the real world. If we, if we in inverted commas, while like we talk about social media and online and talk about deplatforming. One of the problems with deplatforming is that often it is appealing to tech giants like Twitter or Facebook and stuff like that. Stand up people, nice guys, <laughs> like to, to do pla- to deplatform and like and that runs the risk of like you know relying on tech giants to decide who and who shouldn't have a platform. There are groups like Hope Not Hate, who, which make a, have made this a very much part of their kind of deal. Is that kind of not letting explicitly extremist groups have uh, like social media accounts? And there's like pressures on like things like PayPal and other kind of online entities to not them let them use their, their services. And, and that's that's fraught with danger because with the Nigel Farage banking fiascos, it's like it, it's like do who who decides who is politically allowed to, to have this? I think the thing with no platform and the way that I've looked at it at universities, because I, I try to limit myself and is that it's a grassroots tactic. It's a tactic from below. It's it's something that is student led. It is bureaucratic, but like a lot of the times they're not asking the police or the university administration or something to to stop an event from going ahead or something. It's like an action by students. Deplatforming gives up the agency. The and it's something that is the the left wrestles with, like liberal there is a I think there's a lot more kind of centrist liberal kind of agreement with deplatforming so where you could get like kind of mainstream anti-fascist groups like hope not hate supporting it which but it makes other people more wary so jeff sparrow wrote a great book about the christchurch massacre and and online extremism and the the title escapes my head but there's a book by jeff sparrow who's an australian writer and he wrote this book in the wake of the christchurch massacre of really teasing out those complexities which i think not a lot of other people have it's not just a simply like asking elon musk to shut down far right twitter accounts because he's not going to do it we know that the changing nature of cyberspace as well it also seems to change the very aims of what space is useful and the dissemination of ideas. I mean, when it comes to, I mean, for example, having like debate, there's a slew of, sort of leftist debate, have a, a fascist on once we debate them and then so on and so forth. But it's not so much, it seems it's not so much like a, in the university space, we are denying the space to get like 30, 40 people in and then spread it so it's 30, 40 people. 
Mm. It's more like on the online space, it's, it's more like the critique is ultimately something along the lines of if you're doing like a podcast together, you're both making content together. It's like the medium is the message. So no matter how good you are at arguing, you still you still ultimately sort of end up disseminating them. And it, it, yeah. I mean, the, the example I used to use is it's like playing on an album together. I don't care how much your guitar solo really disagreed with that drum with that drum fill. You've both contributed to the same album. It's the medium is the message ultimately. I think that's the limits of it. But that, that I think ties into one of the main critiques of no platforming, which sort of presupposes that we have to sort of debate fascists. But not only that, but we have not so much debate their ideas, but they also have to be in the room and treat it as if everything they are saying, unlike Sartre's anti-Semite, is completely is completely sort of in good faith, which is weird because they all write books. You can just read the books, critique them. But you know, Matt, Matt Goodwin, we have to have him in the room with his book, although. No, no, he, he wants ate his book on TV, so I think that's actually quite dangerous. But just want to go on to this, this one question about, because there was an example of British anti-fascism which didn't use, or at least it has a mythology around it that doesn't have no platform within its sort of tactical repertoire. And that is the case of the BNP leader, Nick Griffin, who after making some sort of electoral gains, particularly around sort of East London, sort of barking and dagged them, the, the myth is he came on to Question Time, which if people with listeners uh, who aren't based in the UK, it's essentially a ask a bunch of pundits and uh, a politicians some questions, and the audience will ask questions. The audience was being picked by someone who was tied to the EDL at one point. And I think if you look back, you couldn't see that reflected. That's how neutral that is. But yeah, the mythology was was that he came on, he was exposed to the fraud he was by the, the virtuous arguments of the audience and the panelists, and then the polling collapsed overnight. And one of the, I think one of the most the best things about your book is you sort of poke holes in the, the presuppositions of that as it comes to actually how it includes sort of grassroots organizing and anti-fascist organizing outside of it. So, so what do you say was the sort of the, the holes in that sort of argument, at least from the historical data you've looked at? Yeah. So one thing is that the British National Party, so the BNP, they win I think two seats at the European elections, so they have two members of the European Parliament. I believe one in London and then one in like the Northeast. And Nick Griffin, he's invited on, on question time. He doesn't do particularly well. He looks like he doesn't have many answers. And the kind of the, the liberal myth is that, ah, oh, look, he was he's exposed to the fraud he was. There was a lot of criticism of Nick Griffin being invited and for Jack Straw, who was a Labour politician, to be on the panel with him, that previously the Labour Party had had some kind of informal, not informal, but kind of like wishy-washy, no platform position that they wouldn't share platforms like debating stages with the National Front. But Jack Straw does this on national TV. And the kind of this myth is that support starts to ebb away from the from the BNP because Nick Griffin is like a buffoon. One thing is that the polling around the BNP actually, I think, goes up in the immediate aftermath, and they kind of like that. The that people go like, oh, he still sells some things, all right, you know. Um, but the the vote does collapse for the BNP over the next little while, but that's not really to do with like him being on TV and exposed as like kind of like a hateful bigot, but because of local anti-fascist campaigners from the Labour Party, from the socialist left, from organisations like Unite Against Fascism, Hope Not Hate, organising to get out for people to, to don't, not vote for the BNP in, uh, in the elections. So like in the 2010 general election, the BNP vote goes, goes down. That's because people are saying, don't vote BNP on the streets, that... that 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 kind of the idea that the the Griffin question time is the is a cause of the downfall of the BNP overlooks the kind of the grassroots campaigning like uh, the the people from below and it's like a mass campaign it's like Billy Bragg and all that because he's the part of barking he he gets all involved in that so I bet and then also one of the other things is that I think not mentioned is that. After 2009, the EHRC, the the, like the Equality Human Rights Commission, like actually have a kind of case against the BNP about membership laws and stuff like that because 
because the BNP is a racialist organization, that there's a kind of a discrimination issue. So they actually had to like spend a lot of money fighting a case in court and dealing with that kind of a bureaucratic anti-fascism, something that has also been critiqued by the left for its kind of uselessness for a long time. Before we get any deeper into the Britishisms, Craig. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Well, thank you for coming on, Evan. It's really nice to meet you. I've been following you on Twitter for a while and have been inured to this discourse now for about three years since meeting Adam. And I I just wanted to, my, my place in this discussion is as a kind of neophyte or naive American in the sense that I don't know or I haven't been inculcated with the history of British politics as a result of living there. And even as somebody who's worked with the the left here in America, and perhaps even considering the generational divide between me and Adam, it's interesting to have encountered this, this body of work that you have provided and are archiving for us. Because as as Gen X leftist, you know, I came from a position that that honored free speech and, and so on. And then, of course, with 2016, Bernie Sanders and the kind of politics that cropped up around there here in America. Not that this was the first time that I heard about deplatforming, but it seemed to have come to the fore in that moment. And upon meeting Adam and all the comrades that I work with now, it's just interesting to see. I mean. Interesting might not be the right word, but it's it's unusual to see the extent to which deplatforming and the movements against it. And I'm thinking about the British left that then became the conservative parties and so forth. It leaves a lot of questions open. For example, what is to be done with respect to how we deal with fascists online? But I, I think the important question that I want to put forward is it seems that not only is this issue from a media standpoint entrenched in British politics, maybe more so in the UK than America. But my question is, what about this financial connection that's involved with those on the side of suppressing the no platformist movement or what we call today anti-woke politics? Because it seems that between the United States and Britain, there is a cross-pollinization of politics, of strategies, and even of money. And if you were talking to an American leftist or even somebody who wasn't a leftist and you wanted to elucidate what has happened in the past 50 years in the UK and how that has had impacts for the Anglophone left and Anglophone politics in general, how would you talk about that? Like, what what are some important notes that you would provide either from your own book or some resources that you would direct them to? Yeah, that's a really great question. So I'm going to take in two ways. I'm going to give actually like that the history of no platform is that very UK centric, but it does have some history in, in, in America that, so no platform is a term that is kind of transnational now and a lot, a lot lefts uh, use it. There's one group in the United States in the 1970s using it. That's the Spartacists. So the, the Trotskyists, like a kind of quite esoteric Trotskyist group starts it it actually starts in new york and they're using no platform as as a term in the as a concept in the 1970s they're organizing demonstrations against like the ku klux klan and the american nazi party that if you if you go to like the Marxist internet archive which has the kind of the full back catalog of the spartacus newspapers as well as the socialist workers party you can see them like having debates about how to approach the American far right, that the Ku Klux Klan try to come onto campus, the American Nazi Party tries to march through Skokie in the in the seventies, and the Spartacus are there saying no platform for fascists, KKK out, and that and they have this fight with the Socialist Workers Party because the Socialist Workers Party is like, well, First Amendment yeah, and all that kind of stuff. So the Spartacus, like for all their kind of weirdness, are actually like kind of right uh, at the front of of using that, that kind of rhetoric in the United States. David Renton, a long-term anti-fascist author, he wrote a book, No Spree- Free Speech for Fascists, and which he compares on both sides of the Atlantic, like the Britain and the American case. And so he kind of teased this out that, that it's kind of a 
debates, and like the American left, because the because the First Amendment particularly like has a kind of has a different attitude in many ways to f- free speech because it's legally enshrined in a lot in in, a, in in many ways. So it's it's kind of not the same. So, but also does have this crossover. And I'll also mention a recent book that's just come out by Lauren Shepard called The Rise of the Right, which looks at right-wing groups on American campuses since the late 1960s and those kind of fights about platforming. They don't, like, the United States doesn't have an NUS. It doesn't have that kind of formal student union national structure. So it becomes much more localized and that you go through student newspapers from the United States is that these become much more ad hoc little battles. Um, going back to the 60s, like when George Lincoln Rockwell, who's the leader of the American Nazi Party, um, tries to speak at, at local colleges and that, like and people, you know, heckle or disrupt or physically prevent him from trying to talk. So th- there is that history there in the United States. But as that you're right that, that this is something that's transnational, that particularly in the last uh, 10, 20 years, like there's a cross fertilization of ideas from from the US and and Britain and it spreads out as well. So Australia is very much where I, where I am now it is is very much kind of also plugged into this Canada New Zealand they're all kind of feeding off these ideas of each other and like and we can point to things like the Koch brothers they fund various kind of free speech campaigns and movements George Monbiot wrote for the Guardian many years ago now that the Koch brothers had given money to spiked to kind of run these kind of free speech campaigns to kind of like give like kind of like yeah free speech free speech for everyone nothing should be banned and stuff like that a spiked is is the kind of successor of the revolutionary communist party and is that kind of the shift from the left mm. to the right Oh, before you go on, Evan, this was something that was new to me when I I met Adam for the first time. I was aware of Spiked Online, but it wasn't until I met British friends that I really understand what was happening with them. So uh, imagine meeting an American guy like me for the first time, American person for the first time, and they ask, what is Spiked Online and what's the connection to the RCP and what is it that they're doing today? Yeah, so Spiked Online is like, you might have come across it, you might not have. You might have been privileged in, in not having to read it. But they're very much plugged into that kind of transnational right-wing culture war discourse. It's a website that's been around for about 20 years, but in the last 10 years, it's really kind of taken off that some of the, the people who contribute to it are on like television, radio, and like Frank, uh, Frank Faridi, who writes for it. He's like working for a Hungarian think tank. Claire Fox, who's contributed to Spiked, she's now in the House of Lords. Mick Hume, who was the first editor of Spiked, I believe, writes for the Daily Mail. Brendan O'Neill, who's like chief editor at Spiked, and he's regularly on kind of like cable news in 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 the UK, and he and he he writes for like Australian outlets, and I'm sure that they're in America as well. But yeah, like the origins of Spike is a really far left Trotskyist, small Trotskyist party, which exists in Britain from the late seventies through to the 1990s. And that they were like ultra left in many ways is that they were like, they took up like no state collaboration, no, no compromise with the Labour Party, militant anti-fascism, militant solidarity with the with Irish Republicanism, that kind of thing. So in many ways, they had this kind of really kind of like bolshy, kind of like far left Trotskyist attitudes. But at the same time is that they were unpredictable and had like that weird positions on many things. So like in the minor strike they took a minority position that there should be a national ballot because the, the way that the minor strike unfolded is that kind of like it happened and then the 
the union had to kind of just like go with it. And it was kind of not decided like like formally that yes, there should be the minor strike, but it just kind of unfolded. So the RCP had the kind of that minority position that like, yeah, that no, we'll go back to drawing board. There needs to be a democratic consensus that there should be a minor strike. And they called it this national ballot, which didn't win them many friends on the British left during that. They also, they were very much, they thought the AIDS crisis was overblown and they kind of thought that kind of the discourse around AIDS in the 1980s was kind of, um, was an excuse to crack down on gay rights. And they're kind of very kind of like wary about safe sex campaigns, for example. And and on this kind of free speech thing is that they thought they thought no platforming was bad because it was a ban on on free speech. They said that we don't ask the police to intervene against National Front. We do that ourselves. So we shouldn't support no platform because it's asking universities or student unions to to crack down on the free speech of people and that snowballs as the party shifts rightwards in the 90s into no platform is bad or because you should can't ban anything free speech for everyone offensiveness is just a subject thing the real the real problem is censorship it's not it's not fascism Adam, I pass it back to you. <laughs> well, I mean, it is, I got it. Whenever I, I talk about this whole sort of, letter, it is hard not to just look completely batshit, isn't it? So, yeah, there's a split in the revolution. There's a split in sort of, the, sort of some international Trotsky tendency over some reading of Capital Volume for each. And then this one Hungarian dude just has like a really popular magazine with all his mates. And then suddenly, jump ahead 20 years, you know, they get live, they get sued for genocide denial, and then suddenly they're everywhere. So you have Manira Mirza working with Boris Johnson for 14 years. Give, Boris Johnson gives the Revolutionary Communist Party a school, <laughs> which is basically just some sort of weird Frank Giretti sort of come, get come up on the scene, great Uncle Frank in mm. speech. Then one of them gets in the House of Lords, Claire Fox. Then they have about 40 front groups, including Siberia, one of the first like internet cafes in the United Kingdom. They're in every, they're like suddenly that these Trotskys are in every paper. And then they have about 40 different bloody front groups about don't divide us, sense about science. Fred, Andrew Eddy starts running the British Pregnancy Advisory Cert, and they're just fucking everywhere. And then suddenly you look up, looking from this history of the British left, and you see Frank Giretti with a very sort of fascist like eagle logo on his substack at CPAC working with Victor Orban. And then I'm like, okay. I mean, how does this get? This seems like it's spiraled. There might be some sort of dialectical progression here from a certain reflexive contrarianism yeah. to what they are there, which is so if you go on the if you go on Spikes Online, they don't recommend you do so. Type in the word trans. It is a transphobic, exterminationist hate mob. And yet it's in every way. You go on the moral maze, it's there. You have the Battle of Ideas Festival. These people are everywhere. It, it's completely that shit just saying like so guys who's that guy well well now we tell you so in one day there was a living marks and yeah boris johnson's been working with the revolutionary communist party you sound nuts <laughs> so, I mean, how does it get to this point and i guess is there any sort of thing that the left can learn from sort of the the, step, the point where they got to this because i mean look let's be honest this is going out on the zero repeater channel look through the backlog when it was owned by the other guys you're going to see a lot of fucking familiar faces there, aren't you? I mean, we were literally brought on to more or less just kick it down the stairs and keep kicking. But it's it's bloody everywhere. And it's it still has this weird allure of kind of this... I mean, because they were the cool party, weren't they? They had the leather jackets. They had the cool magazine. They were, they had a, the in-house post-punk band, Easter House or something. Like, is, is it just maddening thinking about this? How? Did, yeah, so this goes that question. How did it get this weird to an extent do you have a sort of thesis on that and what can the left love today to not be like those guys because it seems like there's a sort of temptation i've noticed of like they're so called i'm not i'm not going to say the word ntpc leftist that, that mm-hmm. ends up just on the page of spite online <laughs> yeah yeah so like the thing is that like rcp stand, starts out as this kind of trotskyist group they're very small 
they don't make a lot of friends on the left. And by the late 80s, that they have like kind of some very left-wing ideas. And then other ones that, as I mentioned before, like the, like the AIDS crisis, their position on that and the position on the minor strike and all stuff. They're not, they, they're kind of like the Robinson Crusoe's of the left is they stand alone. When the Berlin Wall falls down, they start to have a change of heart. And I think it's also kind of a result of their kind of isolation is that they start to move towards not being an activist group on the ground, but kind of emphasizing the battle of ideas. So Frank Faridi, his kind of non plume was Frank Richards, like his party name. Um, and he writes this article for a new magazine they've got called Living Marxism, Midnight of the Century, that uh, Leninim, Leninism has failed, Laborism has failed, like this is after the third, we're coming up to the fourth election that Labor loses, and there's kind of a, like a disillusionment and a withdrawal from kind of working class material politics and to talk about ideas. Ideas is like where it's at, that the way that forward to convince people is this, is this battle of ideas. Instead of like massive demonstrations, that they're organising these big talk fest events, particularly at universities uh, in London, where you invite a, a whole bunch of different people to debate. And the magazine, Living Marxism, it's, it's slick. It's like if you saw Marxism today in the 1980s, was kind of like slick. The Living Marxism is, it, it, it's, it's a step above. It's, it's read by quite a few, quite a few people. You know, who like mu- the readership of Living Marxism is much bigger than anything that the Revolutionary Communist Party could have. And, the, and it goes in for kind of like that contrarianism that if the left thinks one thing, we think another thing. But we'll use kind of like left-wing rhetoric to come up with our, with our positions. So their slogans were like something like, question everything, ban nothing. And they start to move from like this kind of, from a left-wing perspective into something kind of like libertarian, contrarian, kind of like weird. It's hard to define. But it's a gradual rightward shift. And what kind of also contributes to the end of living Marxism, as I mentioned, is the the trial. They get sued for libel because they, they publish an article by a German writer who claims that like kind of ITN, so we're one of the news services, and some journalists in the UK had kind of doctored footage to do with the wars in the Balkans and 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 kind of the ethnic cleansing there. And they go really go on this kind of like this big thing about like it's the manufacturing of the story about the and the demonization of Serbia during the Balkans wars. Eventually they get sued, but instead of compromising or sort of settling the case as they take it to the courts and they lose again and they lose that case. They campaign that this is a, a denial of free speech, and eventually the kind of the debt from losing that court case means they wind down. But now the internet is everywhere. They started an internet cafe in the 1990s when the internet they are like they are embracing the internet much more quickly than the rest of the British left. So like the SWP are still thinking the internet is like a bourgeois like thing that we can ignore the internet. But so by 2000. 2001 spike that they go we don't need a physical magazine people are eventually going to stop reading magazines where we need to be is online so that's where spiked online comes from and the people who were members of the revolutionary communist party the communist the it dissolves the 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 magazine has been the most important thing they don't need a physical party membership and they kind of spread into the ether like let a thousand post trotskyist bloom and they go into everywhere. So Claire Fox, who is now like a, a lord or baroness, she's in the House of Lords, she creates a thing called the Institute of Ideas, which puts on these events of like, everything is up for debate. And we'll invite kind of like a whole bunch of people from a whole bunch of different range of views, including people, some people with odious views to kind of have these kind of, these kind of public debates. Um, 
McHume, he's like, he'd been the the editor of a living master at one stage and he's now working with spike online but he's also writing a column for the times freedy he's an academic he's a so- sociologist he goes off into kind of academia but then is kind of like getting and making a name for himself as a media commentator and takes up more and more right-wing positions so yeah so like this year he's at cpac talking about national conservatism and now he's working with hungarian think tanks which have links to the orban regime and then there's a whole bunch of other people and then and but it also starts to attract a new wave of people who weren't in the party but kind of contribute so people like brendan o'neill joanna williams like these people write in the dying days of of living marxism but then their media commentators they can write for Spiked. People like Manira Mirza. Now she works for Boris Johnson. She's a policy advisor for you know over a decade. She's like closely linked with the Boris Johnson. She's working with all that. She starts off with working with the Institute of Ideas and that kind of post RCP Miller. But she's a bit the the media says she was a re- member of the Revolutionary Communist Party. I don't think that is the case because she's like coming to university age at a time when the party is ending, but she's around those people. It's a cohort. It's a network. It's loose. People go in and out. So Kenan Malik, he's, he writes to the observer. He's written a new book, not so black and white. He comes out of this as, as well, but he hasn't taken the, he hasn't gone as far and he's kind of divorced himself from spiked in the last 10 years. But it so it goes off in different directions, and people come, people go. But Spike is the kind of organizing vehicle for this kind of post left and lessons. As I said, it's a slippery slope from being contrarian to appearing on Spike. So that there, there is a tendency on the left to say to put two fingers up at convention. And 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 at left wing convention, but that unchecked can lead into kind of yeah you know, into kind of that that kind of contrarian era contrarianism for contrarian's sake, and then you end up like essentially parroting similar lines to the right just to annoy the rest of the left, and um I'm not gonna mention names but you can see that kind of today with people who in the left who have a media presence and sometimes they go well no one else is saying this i'm going to say it and then it ends up going from an irony to you know an unabashed political position so that's the one of the things that of the left is to be wary of is that why why are we arguing this are we, are we being contrarian just for the sake of being contrarian? And who are we targeting with that contrarianism? Is we should be like cynical about a lot of things, but uh, but we can just get cynical for too cynical and get wrapped up in kind of like talk fests, and then we end up, you know, writing for the spectator. <laughs> it seems to me, and cards on the table here, there was a time at which I was in a Discord server for this channel when it was run by the previous folks. And it was interesting reading the last chapter of your book and and seeing the quote where Roger Scruton said something to the effect of he wanted to dissolve all universities. And it's interesting to see a version of that view parroted on the old Zero Discord server by many people there because they feel it's an incubator for the professional managerial class and so forth. We all know the rhetoric that goes with that. But I think listening to you here, one, one of my big questions is where are we now? Because it seems, well, once again, there was somebody who was a big part of this channel in the past before we came on, who is now associated with the think tank MCC Belgium with Frank Faridi. And it seems that there's an even stronger vested financial interest. One evening, I just spent an hour and 10 or an hour and 15 minutes listening to one of these conventions, and it just completely smacks of conservatism, talking about national sovereignty in the way that conservatives do. And so 
it's hard to even say that there's a gray area, especially now that you have a movement called national conservatism where some people who used to be associated with this group are now appearing front and center at the podium. So where are we now? And what is the current landscape with respect? Like, what is the epilogue to your book? Well, that's the thing is that since I wrote the book, I published my book in 2020, and so much has happened since then. The whole Black Lives Matter statues, like the the conservative government brought in legislation. I published the book, then the conservatives decided to bring in new legislation to kind of say that student unions can't know platform, free speech and or is now, but you, know, you can sue if you get no platform in the UK. That things are happening rapidly. And yeah, like that there is a kind of like a, like a, a material interest in being that kind of like iconoclastic post left person that, that like it spiked it's to a certain extent like unheard quillet compact the, the canadian one there's kind of different versions of i always get them the names kind of because they're all kind of innocuous and you kind of go oh yeah but like but you can see the networks and and I think that it's hard, like that each time, like that something like this happens, is that like, so, it, like particularly online, to a Twitter discourse is like, you shouldn't be interviewing Matthew Goodwin. You shouldn't be like, you shouldn't like share a stage with this person because that's not good. The, the left should have a kind of pro trans position on things. And then like other sections, who call themselves the left go, well, that's a middle-class position. That's not very materialist. You're denying free speech. So one thing is that the, the left, the Anglophone left, like in Britain, the United States, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, like places like that that have this kind of a similar political environments and the shared political environment is being robust in their defense of minority rights like you know being like pro-trans like being like an explicitly anti-racist standing up against homophobia standing up against misogyny and stuff like that being kind of confident of that and being aware that the kind of like there will people who use left-wing language to kind of end up arguing right-wing positions so it, it is kind of like being discourse aware, but also being robust in defense of kind of like, of, yeah, of being in defense of those people who need to be defended. I remember being at a counter demo. So there's sort of counter demos every month in Honor Oak against uh, Turning Point, the UK, various GB news people, and just outright fascists, of course, who are less uh, good at hiding it, <clears throat> protesting a drag queen story hour stuff, but just doing a big anti-trans protest. But one, some of the stuff I noticed was how much it is just about getting media. These people just want exposure because they see themselves as being able to, to go viral in a way. And I can't, yeah, it is interesting, the whole idea of we have to go on to these platforms because it's, it's a very materialist argument in the sense of it's material for the person who wants to sell books or get GB users fee. Or, and apparently, I mean, Unheard and Compact pay very well. I mean, Compact can because it's loss making. Uh, Unheard makes money, sadly. But it's, it's definitely an idealism to this. Of, their ideas don't have any effect. And, and that's why we should, we, it's okay to sort of spread them with them. But my ideas are so great that they will just be wowed over and they'll be sort of like one of the good ones. And I, it, does, it does seem to really take the aspect exactly of the collective power because it reduces it to the individual speaker. It doesn't sort of tie it to the collective voice, which says, you're not welcome here. And I think that's just a really good thing of just the necessity. Of, of collective struggle and collective solidarity beyond and, yeah, and being discourse sensitive. But I guess how, how can people be a bit more discourse sensitive about these kind of things? Because I mean, there is the thing of saying, oh, that person's part of the LM network. And they say, what's the LM network? And then they've already left because they think you're completely mad, because <laughs> it's a completely mad story. Yeah. So how, how yeah. do we help? Yeah, how do we sort of tell people a bit more sensitive about this? Or just say like, 
not just the biscuit voice. But sort of like actually, this person is, is is trying to trick you. Yeah, like I mean, we're getting into stuff away from my historical brain. But the thing is, like, when they, to be wary of people like who talk about rights, who talk about sovereignty, and 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 stuff like that. What are they actually arguing? And what uh, when they say that the woke left is actually a middle class thing that, you know, that it's just a, a middle class elite and the real working class are actually kind of have traditional values, et cetera, et cetera. To be in, in interrogating what do they what do they mean and what are they actually arguing? It's not just about the individuals, but like the kind of the message like that a lot of time, like you go, oh, that person's arguing. Okay, I can kind of like ignore what they're saying. But you know, new these new people spread, pop up all the time. They're like mushrooms. So, I th- so, it's being kind of like aware of like how the discourse on rights and the, and and class and this kind of like essentializing of like the working class, like that that because they're economically Trump voters are all economically challenged, so they feel left behind. So they, they they don't feel connection to the left, so they move to the right. So when people are using you know, the working class and working class values, or if they use like a signifier like white working class, that you can kind of like be interrogating those those ideas. Yeah, like. I would reckon like reading stuff by people like Aaron Winter and Aurelia Mondon and stuff like that, thinking about reactionary democracy, the books like that, like, yeah, you know, they're, they're very good at kind of unpacking like Gavin Titley or Alana Lenton, like kind of like try interrogating how the post, the like sections of the right use left wing language to advance right wing ideas. I would just call them watchwords, like like you said, working class, even bourgeoisie, middle class. Those kind of words have different connotations between different groups. I mean, another good piece to read as well is that Race and Class put out an amazing piece the other day called, I'm, I'm only saying this works, it's in the title, The Anatomy of Britain's War on Work, and it's basically a giant chart. And a lot of time founders here might see some familiar faces, but I know we're coming up to the hour now. Uh, I was like, Evan, what, was it, what are you working on now? How is the continuing historical work on sort of the RCP going? And are we, is, is, is there a new book in the pipeline? So, yeah, COVID put a big kibosh on my RCP project to get it done as quickly as I would like. But I am continuing with, with working on the RCP, delving into actually what I've been doing is looking at the undercover police files that have been uncovered from the UCPI inquiry. They they surveil the RCP in the early days. So that's one thing I've been looking at. I will mention that Jack Hepworth, who is writes about the left and Ireland and stuff like that, he actually has a book coming out about the RCP that I think is coming out through Bloomsbury later this year. So yeah, my work is ongoing with looking at the RCP. My, the, my late, my kind of formal book project at the moment is looking at moral panics, which is kind of like, an extension of this, looking at the the origins of today's culture wars in Thatcherism in the 1980s. And I wrote a thing for The Guardian like two years ago saying the war on woke has its origins in the in, in the moral panics of the 1980s. So my project is really looking at how did the various moral panics of the 1980s fit together into a kind of a coherent political package that the Thatcher regime, that the Thatcher government was able to exploit? So like the Section 28, so the kind of the, the, the moral panic against, against homosexuality and kind of the moral panic against immigration and the moral panic around video nasties, the moral panic around rave culture, and around students and around all kind of things, how they, how that all fit into one political package that was offered up as Thatcherism. So really kind of giving a prehistory of today's culture war is the next thing I'm working on. It has a lot of RCP stuff in it, but it also has an overlap to no platform. It overlaps with a lot of things. And it overlaps with Sue Ella Braverman going on about a hurricane of migrants, the kind of like that rhetoric. 
that moral panics. Oh, yes. So the brave man showing that she is the last member of the Revolutionary Conservative Party. All right, Evan, thank you so much for coming on. I've wanted to do a conversation for a while. Huge fan of the archive work you're doing. Of course, put a link to your blog, Hatful of History, in the description. And thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. We appreciate your support of the imprint and the channel. Subscribe to Zero Books today on Patreon. Your material support helps us to promote a variety of perspectives on the left. Also, discover the many titles, new and old, that Zero has curated. Navigate to any of the links in the show notes to extend your support.